I'm now pleased to welcome Dr. Adam Boyko to the stage. Thank you, John. All really right. great to be here. Uh, I, I, I love going to Westminster in person, but we can do it virtual uh, this year. It gives um, us the opportunity to, uh, to, to have this conference talk about dog genetic testing, dog research, dog uh, health. I'm really excited about it. Um, so I'm a professor at Cornell studying canine genomics, also co-founder and chief science officer at Embark. And so I'm really excited about dogs and genetics. Um, I think there are a, a wonderful species for studying um, for studying genetics. And we know a lot more about dogs than we do about pretty much any other species outside of you know maybe humans and mice. That's right. That's right. And I would just, just call out or highlight that you're also Embark's co-founder, chief science officer, and some of your research uh, has helped uncover uh, the genetic basis for many canine diseases and traits, including um, those that power some of the genetic health tests relied upon today by breeders and dog owners. So, so yeah, thanks again. yeah, for sure. Yeah. So thanks again very much. And we'll let you take it away. Great. So let me make sure I got my, uh, my slide thing working here. Um, yeah. So really excited to be here. I'm just going to jump, you know, right into it. We know more about dog genetics than we do almost any other species. So if you look on the, the catalogs of known mutational um, databases, uh, you know, there's over 300 genetically characterized uh, traits and disorders uh, in dogs. And, uh, and it, it's just awesome to be in a world where we can, uh, where we have the technology that we can test for um, the vast majority uh, of those in a single genetic test like this. And and the reason why dogs have been so great, so you know, Dr. Friedenberg talking about GWAS is a, is a terrific um, introduction, but it's, it's because we've bred dogs for so many different forms and functions, and there's so many different breeds of dogs. And, uh, and you know, because we have these genomic tools now, the dog genome was decoded over 15 years ago with the, with the boxer Tasha, um, you know, being published. And we've been able to develop these genomic technologies in in genotyping arrays, um, and because of the breed structure in dogs, it makes them really effective for identifying the genetic basis of Mendelian traits and disorders um, and, and, and genes that have large phenotypic consequences. And so if you were to, you know, for example, take a whole bunch of boxers that all have a particular, um, you know, genetic defect or a particular trait, um, and you run them on, on genome-wide association, you know, uh, SNP chips, um, you'll, you'll be able to find regions of the genome that are identical in all of those individuals in whatever breed um, that, that share that trait or phenotype. Um, and, and what makes dogs unique is you have all of these other breeds as well. And a lot of times the genetic basis in one breed is also found in related breeds, but it's going to occur on a slightly different haplotype background. So by looking at lots of different breeds of dogs, you can identify other breeds that also show a correlation in this genomic region. And you can really quickly hone in on the one or two genes, you know, so, so basically you're going from this really large area of the genome that may be associated when you just looked at boxers and you're able to hone in on a zip code. If you're looking in a, you know, maybe you're looking in boxers in Europe versus America, or maybe you're, um, you know, looking in, in maybe a, a bully breed that's related to boxer that has the same um, genetic defect. And so by using, these sorts of different levels of genetic mapping and, and sometimes looking at one breed, sometimes looking at many breeds and using the tools to our disposal, we've been able to identify lots and lots of variation underlying Mendelian diseases and, and traits of interest. And so, for example, in my lab, um, you know, we work with a uh, 173,000 marker array and um, working with the Cornell Biobank and researchers at Cornell, we were able to to genotype dogs from 158 different breeds. So there's over 4,000 dogs that we studied. At the time, it was the largest dog GWAS study ever. And using genome-wide association um, you know, mapping, we can identify 18 regions of the genome that are highly associated with adult um, body weight. And in fact, you can take the genetics around these genes and build a model that explains over 80% of the variation in, in adult size. So that's much better than you would ever be able to do in people. You know, with people, you need to have studies of millions of individuals. You'll identify hundreds and hundreds of regions of the genome that are associated with adult size, and you're still only going to be able to predict, you know, 20, 30% of the variation um, in, in adult height or weight. 
Um, another phenotype that we use genome-wide uh, mapping for in my lab is fur shedding. So, you know, we've known for a while uh, that, that poodles and, and dogs with their coat don't shed, and that's because of, uh, you know, work uh, that I did in collaboration with Elena. So Elena Ostrinser's lab, um, you know, Rand and I was just a postdoc um, uh, with the R-spondin gene. So there's an insertion there that leads to this wired coat and furnishings, and that's going to uh, preclude uh, shedding for dogs that have that coat. But for dogs that have a normal coat that, that don't have this wired furnished um, look, um, running a GWAS study, we can see that there's another region of the genome that hadn't been implicated in any coat phenotypes before. It's this melanocortin-5 receptor on chromosome one. And in fact, there's a missense mutation there that's highly predictive of whether you're going to have a, um, a heavy shedding, you know, sort of wolf-like coat, or whether you're going to have this, you know, light to medium, shorter um, coat that's, that's lower shedding um, that you would see, per, for instance, in a pug or a boxer or, or something like that. And so we can, we can start to piece together how different um, coat traits um, lead to different uh, different rates of shedding. And so that's work that we're following up with right now uh, at MMARC. Uh, and another example of GOS, so we, we don't have to look at just, you know, traits or, or even specific diseases. We can look at any phenotype and try to get genetic associations with them. And so uh, a, a DVM PhD student in my lab, now, now in uh, Eleanor Carlson's lab, um, uh, Michelle White went through, and, and again, in collaboration with the Cornell Biobank, we, we looked at the CBC and chem, chem, blood chemistry panels that were run on the dogs that we had already genetically characterized, you know, because we, we were interested in disease mapping, we were interested in, in, in trait mapping, we were interested just generally in the diversity of dogs. So we had all of this genetic data and we were trying to build phenotypes into it. And when, and when we did that, we could see several blood phenotypes that we could find associations to. And one of the more interesting ones I thought um, was alanine aminotransferase. So this ALT value, um, that veterinarians use um, as a diagnostic indicator of liver damage or liver disease. And we could see if we just look at, you know, hundreds of dogs that we've already genetically characterized and that had blood work done while they were healthy, um, we could see that the ALT values in that blood work uh, are associated with variation in this region. And, and interesting, this region is right over the gene GPT that encodes for that transfer. So it makes a lot of sense that there would be a connection. So there's some variant, some specific mutation in this region is poorly characterized in the reference genome. So I think there's some structural variation here that, that, that's um, you know, making it difficult. But by looking at the genotypes in this region, we can predict whether a dog is normally gonna be showing a normal range ALT value or whether it's gonna be on the lower end. And so we could, so I, you know, just to show you some of, the, some of the plots here, if you look at healthy dogs, you know, the ALT, you know, ranges from about nine to about 99. And you get this nice normal distribution and it's, uh, you know, right around, I guess, 58 is, is, the, is the mean. But for dogs that have one or two copies of this mutant haplotype, this A allele, they're gonna have lower values and two copies is even lower than, than one copy. So it's sort of an additive sort of thing. And if you actually look at these dogs that have two copies of the A allele, their normal range, these are all healthy dogs, is, is more like five to 50. It's less like nine to 99. And so this doesn't really, this doesn't have a consequence on the dog's health, but it does have a consequence in interpreting this, this um, you know, ALT value from the blood work. And we went back then, you know, so we, did, we used healthy dogs to make this GWAS discovery, but going back and looking at dogs that actually did get diagnosed with liver damage, we could, you know, so they weren't used to, to establish this GWAS, but now if we look at them and we say, well, okay, so this dog was diagnosed with liver damage, it got an ALT value measured, and we have the genotype at this locus, and we could see that a lot of the dogs that were low normal for, for ALT and had liver damage actually had ALT values that were still in the normal range. So everything was elevated up, but somebody not knowing that this dog was um, you know, genotypically predisposed to have lower ALT values might miss the fact that ALT was elevated in this dog because it still falls within the normal interval. So this just argues that we want to we want to get to a world where we have more personalized interpretations of clinical data and less sort of like rigid reference intervals or even breed specific ones. Right? This this ALT value it does vary by breed according to how frequent 
um, this haplotype is found in the breed, but it's really whether or not that individual dog carries it, not how prevalent that haplotype is in the breed. And so, so we're really interested in personalizing uh, uh, veterinary medicine. So with that introduction, um, you know, now, now for some of the, you know, negative stuff, like we've done a great job, I feel, as a, as a canine genomics community, um, building tools and building studies and, you know, with the work of Mars Animal Foundation and AKC Canine Health Foundation, you know, some of these, like, I've gotten grants from myself, you know, as well as NIH and, and, and institutes like that. Um, we've been able to identify the genetic basis of many Mendelian diseases, um, large effect quantitative trait loci underlying things like fur morphology and, uh, and body size. Um, but when it comes to looking at things like uh, complex diseases, you know, we know, we know dogs vary in their, you know, in their predisposition to cancer. Uh, you know, if you know the breed of the dog, you can, there's different prevalences of cancer. There's different cancers that are common. There must be a genetic basis to explain this. Um, but for the most part, we don't know what those genes are. You know, same thing with autoimmune disease, same thing with orthopedic disease, um, same thing with behavior, as, as, um, as Dr. Hare was, um, uh, was, was talking so eloquently about. You know, dogs are this fantastic model. We've bred them to have all different sorts of behaviors, and they can have positively selective behaviors. They can have problematic behaviors uh, like obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and, and very few of these behaviors have we identified a genetic basis for. And so it makes it hard for, for breeders to, to use genetics to breed these complicated um, conditions in or out of their lines. And then, of course, another you know, area of great interest of mine is, is aging and longevity. And we know that, you know, different breeds of dogs age, you know, at different rates, perhaps a twofold uh, difference in aging rate between, between toy breeds and giant breeds. Um, is it all body size? Are there some other aspects to aging that are important? Can we breed dogs that live um, you know, longer? To me, this is all a data problem, right? The, the problem is um, the academic work going on uh, is looking at hundreds of dogs. Um, you know, and so you, you know, my, my lab at Cornell looked at 4,200 dogs, you know, the largest study at that time done in dogs. And that was great, but it still wasn't enough to really build a, a predictive model for hip dysplasia or for lymphoma or for mast cell tumor, for lots of stuff that we were interested in. Um, and, and we can see from the human data that really you need hundreds of thousands of, of individuals in these studies. If you have truly complex phenotypes with incomplete penetrance, there might be environmental issues, there might be gene by gene interactions, there's all sorts of complexities. And it's, it's still genetics, it's still solvable, but you have to have the data to do it. So that, um, I, I, I don't shy away from big data. So this is just the, the one slide. So, so my introduction into dog genetics, um, you know, as a postdoc was working with my uh, uh, brother, Ryan, because there were all of these sorts of questions about where did dogs come from? And, and we thought that was also a big data problem. And we thought that, you know, purebred dogs are fantastic, but really if you want to study dog origins, uh, you need to look at something that hasn't been quite as, as modified, right? You need to look at dogs all around the world. And so, you know, we saw that big data problem. Uh, we tackled it. We tackled, you know, probably 2,000 um, village dogs across the world. We genetically characterized, uh, you know, nearly 600 of them. And we could actually come up with a map of dog diversity that pretty, pretty clearly shows a center of origin um, for dogs in, in Central Asia. So, so dogs and big data work well together. But how are we going to get big data now to tackle cancer, to tackle hip dysplasia, to tackle uh, behavior, all of these things that we're interested in. Well, one thing, um, you know, that, that, that caught our attention is, um, you know, dogs are actually, lots of dogs are getting genetically characterized every single year. Um, dog DNA testing is a thing, and, uh, and it's been great. I mean, so as discoveries are made, there are testing labs out there that you can go and you can get your dog tested for, for that variant. And they've, they've done a fantastic job at reducing the prevalence of known inherited Mendelian disorders um, in, in, in lots of breeds. You know, there's great scientists doing it, there's great labs doing it, and there's hundreds of thousands of dogs that were, that were getting tested. And me, as a researcher at Cornell, is like, yeah, but they're not, they're not running them on like my research array, right, that, that, that everybody else is using in the academic community, right? So, so, looking at one marker 
that's predictive is great, but it doesn't build this discovery engine that we can use to make new discoveries, right? And so it's a one-off test. There's not any feedback coming in and there's not that genetic database there um, that can be used to power, uh, you know, what are the genes for behavior? What are the genes, of, you know, for cancer? Um, and, and so we, we had this idea that, well, what if a dog DNA test was actually a research chip? You know, what if we modify these research chips so that they would test for most of the, the known diseases that were of interest to test for most of the traits that were done. Um, they, they, you know, gave actionable information now as a DNA test, but they could be this genetic data repository for the breed to power new discoveries in the breed. And so as new conditions are developing in the breed, you already have this genetic database. We already know which individuals have been diagnosed with that condition. And so we can quickly tap that database or work in conjunction with others to offer that information um, so that those discoveries can be made. And it's, it, and it's, it's nice because if you're working from a genome wide SNP array, you're going to be able to get a genome wide assessment of things like inbreeding and relatedness. You're not going to have to rely on pedigrees or, or, you know, a few dozen microsatellites in order to make those determinations. You're also going to be able to infer ancestry and sex and, and all this other information for every single sample that you test. So you know that the sample you're looking at matches what the, breeder who sent it in said it was going to be. So, so now a breeder can't send in a sample from a different dog, from a different breed to, to, to get a false test that, you know, it's clear, you know? And so, so we think it's a more powerful test, um, you know, that way. So we saw, we saw all of this potential and we're like, well, you know, is this something that will, is, that will possibly work out? And that was the, uh, that was the idea for, um, you know, uh, over five years ago now, founding, uh, founding Embark. We wanted to leverage consumer genetic testing so that it could go and, um, and be part of, of uh, canine genetic research. And so this is, um, this is a mission-driven company. You know, our mission is to end preventable disease in dogs. And the way to do that is to test dogs for the known conditions that we can test for so that good breeding decisions are made. Um, but it's also to then drive the research so that we can start to make the next generation of canine genetic tests, um, you know, and, and, and start to explore these areas that, that, you know, there just isn't funding through NIH. There just isn't, you know, there, there's, you know, great work with the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, for instance. I think there's going to be lots of great stuff that comes out of there. But that's a $30 million study by Morris, and not every breed can afford to do that. And I think every breed should be able to have a genomic repository uh, for their breed so that they can, the things that are most important to them, there's actually data there and, and they can work with us or they can work with their favorite researcher um, to tap that data and, and make those discoveries. If you're doing genetic testing anyway, it seems like a no brainer that you want to have this. And so we launched the test in 2016. Uh, it tested for 150 different health conditions. It tested for, you know, just over a dozen, uh, you know, different traits and stuff. Uh, t um, you know, it was just, sort of a page dump, right? Like this is all the things we tested for. This is what your dog was at risk for. This is what your dog was a carrier for, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and if you look at the test today, it's actually it's actually substantially different. I mean, we've evolved it. We're now, um, if, you, if you tested with us today, we're looking at about 200 different health conditions. So we've really upped the count of things that we can test for. And we've also broken it down um, into things that are relevant based on the breed of your dog and to, into all the other stuff, right? Because we don't want it to be distracting. Obviously we're testing for a lot of stuff that isn't in your breed um, because your breed is one breed out of, you know, 350 and there, there's more out there that we're adding all the time. Um, but but this way, you know, you you know, particularly for people that are doing, um, you know, designer crosses or new to breeding, you know, like trying to a la carte figure out what you should be testing for shouldn't be a stopper. Um, you, should, you should just get a test that tells you what's relevant for your breed. Uh, and, and what's not. And, and, you know, of course, in addition to the breed information, there's now a ton of trait information. We're, we're up to about 30 different uh, trait mutations that we're testing for actually more if you count for body size. Uh, and we're, and we're going to be adding more. So this is an evolving, um, you know, sort of thing. We, we, uh, we send updates. So if we can update your dog based on the chip it was run on, um, you get that. We want to carry on uh, communication with you. We want to know um, if your dog is getting diagnosed or stuff because we want your dog to help uh, power um, genetic research. Um, other, you know, other things that the test gives that we thought were very important was inbreeding. 
So when you do genome wide information, you can you can actually peer at the genome and you can you can visibly see where inbreeding tracks occur uh, for your dog. And so that's how we calculate inbreeding. It's strictly the COI is the proportion of the genome that is identical by descent from the maternal and paternal lines. And so it shows up here as blue. These are runs of homozygous uh, markers on the array. And you can you can see if you were to compare to um, the STR based methods of looking at, you know, relatedness, um, it, it's really a course indicator. There's not even STRs on every single chromosome. And so it's really just a matter of did that STR happen to intersect a run of homozygosity or not? And there's, there, there's quite a lot of variation. So it's, so it's much more precise if you can look across the genome and actually define the intervals where there is inbreeding and calculate inbreeding from the bottom up. Uh, approach that way. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about inbreeding, um, you know, later in this talk as well. Um, but but importantly, um, because we have this bottom-up way of, of detecting inbreeding, relatedness is sort of the same thing. You're looking at shared haplotypes between two dogs um, that, that perhaps you're planning on, on mating. And so we have this matchmaker tool um, that can go through and you can compare two dogs and it will tell you what the expected inbreeding coefficient of the litter is going to be uh, you know, based on those two dogs. So if you want to make inbreeding part of your breeding decision, you have this ability to to select for higher or lower um, COI uh, litters, which, which you know, I'd argue is pretty important. Um, I think probably the most important aspect, at least for me as a researcher, um, you know, for Embark, is that we also have this research page. And so every single um, dog that's, that's embarked on their profile, you can click on research, and there's going to be um, what we call surveys that you can do. And right now, we just launched um, a couple weeks ago um, the annual health uh, uh, survey. So you can tell us all about your dog's health um, over the last year. This is what we, we were spotlighting. But as you scroll down, there's also other surveys about behavior, environment, you know, different physical traits, um, um, other sorts of disease tests. And we're adding we're adding surveys all the time. And this is the engine of discovery, right? So we've got. Um, you know, if, if we if we look at how Embark's been uh, been doing since we launched, uh, we have I am happy to say uh, just reached the threshold of uh, half a million dogs uh, that have been tested and have genetic profiles opted in for scientific discovery um, in our in our database, and we want to get as much phenotypic information from these dogs as possible, so that we have this discovery engine now that we can use um, to make to to make new discoveries. And, uh, and, and really, um, this, th this database size wouldn't be possible if we weren't both trying to um, sell, sell kits uh, to breeders and uh, to owners and, and consumers, right? Both kinds of dogs are important for scientific discovery. And so, so we want to be able to serve the needs of both communities. Um, we're, we're never gonna reach our mission of ending preventable disease in dogs um, if we don't have breeders making intelligent uh, breeding decisions, and if we don't have owners making intelligent, um, you know, care decisions with their veterinarians that are genomically informed, so that's what that's what we're reaching for. Uh, I'm very happy. I just checked. I um, I, I think we're the only five star, not only dog DNA test, but like DNA test available. Um, right now on Amazon. And I think that's a testament just to the, the broader team at Embark that's really been mission focused, has really worked very, very hard. Uh, genetics is really complicated and, and getting genetics right for hundreds of conditions and hundreds of breeds is a complicated thing. And I'm going to talk about some of those, um, you know, some of those complications here. And, you know, we're trying, and, and, you know, of course, this is a $159 test, so it's not, it's not cheap. It is we, we on our website, breeders can get the test uh, for cheaper because we really value the relationship that we have with breeders and the importance that they have um, in dog genetic health. Um, and if you haven't tried our test before, there is an introductory $99 breeder test. So I, I'd encourage you to at least uh, try it out at that level and see if it serves uh, your breeding needs. Um, but but lots of complications arise uh, you know, from this from this testing. So, so one of them is if you're testing for everything that's known, Right, you don't like the discovery was made in a certain breed, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the the risk or the protectiveness or the or whatever is going to translate across all breeds. For many conditions, that seems to be the case, but but for other conditions, something that's a risk factor in one breed is clearly not a risk factor in another breed. 
And so, so that's why we, we split up our test results into breed relevant and breed not relevant. Uh, but, but there's still always going to be fuzziness about that, right? So, you know, uh, golden retriever ichthyosis, we know is relevant in golden retrievers. Um, we have also seen about a half dozen carriers of golden retriever ichthyosis in Labrador retriever. Now, as far as I know, we've never seen a Labrador retriever that had this form of ichthyosis. Um, but until we actually see a lab that tests as a case, we actually won't know whether or not it's there. And so this is this is kind of the value. We can, we can monitor in the background these risk factors that we're seeing and sometimes seeing them in related breeds or, or surprising breeds. And um, because we have this relationship with the owners and the breeders, we can see whether or not um, there is a, an association in the in these few breeds, and, and we can report things accordingly. So, you know, our typical reporting, you know, something like MDR1, um, we can, you know, that's been found in many, many breeds. It, it always seems to associate um, with drug sensitivity. So regardless of what breed your dog is, if we observe um, one or two copies of the MDR1 ivermectin sensitivity, um, it, your dog will be reported as at risk and, and you should monitor, um, you know, the, the, the various foods and drugs that your, that your dog is given uh, accordingly. Um, but for other conditions, um, you know, for instance, for this, um, this uh, PRA, um, we know that there are other mutations in breeds um, that change whether or not this mutation that we're testing for um, leads to uh, an increased risk for PRA. And so the reality is if you're, if you're not a dachshund or, or one of a handful of breeds, um, we aren't able to say whether or not this, you, we're, we're testing your dog for this mutation, but it's not coming back as at risk for the mutation. It's coming back as a, we tested for it, um, but because this hasn't been described in your breed, we don't think it's actually predisposing in your breed. And so this is particularly important for things like degenerative myopathy, where, you, where the variant is not completely penetrant and in fact, the variant is common in some breeds where we don't ever see the disorder. And so we wouldn't recommend breeding for something like that in that breed. You, you, you don't have a problem with that disease. Clearly the genetic background of your breed is preventing that problem from happening. So focus on the things that are genetic problems with your breed. But it's something where we're always trying to get more, more data so that we can say things um, you know, more and more precisely. So validation is another important issue for the genetic testing. You know, there's, there's new conditions that are added all the time. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times in people's mind, validation is just simply, oh, it, does your, is your test reporting on the mutation correctly? And of course, that's an important component of validation, but I think it's actually one of the, you know, the, the um, not the most important one. That not, doesn't seem to be the one that, that, that trips people up most of the time. So for the most part, these arrays are, you know, are very, very clean. We are testing for each health condition and each trait multiple using multiple probes and we can, you know, and then, you know, instead of having a human looking at a banding pattern on PCA, we actually have a computer looking at the clustering of points that, that is, you know, we have clear dogs, we have carrier dogs, uh, we have at risk dogs and they cluster in very different locations. And if you have multiple probes and they're concordant, that's a really, really good indication that this dog has that mutation, but we need to validate that that mutation is actually predictive of the condition. Because again, a lot of the studies that are being done identifying these petitions, uh, mutations are done in one breed or just a, a small number uh, of dogs. And if this is something that's more widely distributed, um, we, don't, we don't necessarily know that it's gonna be predictive across there. And so, you know, a couple recent examples that we've had, uh, bald thigh syndrome. So this was a publication that was made a couple of years ago. We've added, we added the marker to the array, um, but before we, um, made it a test that got reported to consumers, we were seeing that, oh, this is actually segregating in, in more breeds uh, than just greyhounds. What's going on? And so we could, we could send a survey to owners that, that had dogs that had the bald thigh variant, and then we could send them to other owners that had dogs of the same breed that didn't have that variant, and we could see how predictive the variant was for bald thigh syndrome, which is obviously not completely penetrant. It has variable expressivity. It was only identified in, in um, greyhounds. And what we find out is it is actually predictive in other breeds, but it, they have to be breeds that are related to greyhounds. So it's predictive in silken wound tones, it's predictive in whippets, um, but we also saw it in Pomeranians, Yorkies, not predictive in those breeds. And that's probably expected. I haven't seen a Yorkie with bald thigh syndrome before, 
Um, so there must be other stuff going on, uh, you know, with the code that makes it so that, that they don't get that. Uh, atopic dermatitis is a very, very hot topic. Um, there was a publication done a couple years ago on that. It focused on West Highland uh, White Terriers, and um, it, we added it to the array. Um, it was segregating at a rather high frequency, um, so we decided the responsible thing to do is to ask owners and see what the rate of reporting atopic dermatitis is. And what we found is in our broader population sample, we weren't seeing any significant trend for dogs that carry that variant versus not. So it could be linked to a causal variant in Westies and then just not linked in the broader thing. And so more research is needed, um, you know, or it could just be, you know, a statistical issue. Um, but it's not a test that we would be ready to offer, even though it's something that's that's appeared in the in the scientific literature. Now, obviously, talking to to breeders and owners and and, and learning about uh, the health of their dog, um, it, it helps with validating uh, existing tests. Um, but but really, uh, what excites us is the is this opportunity to make new discoveries. And so, you know, as Ryan when he when he opened up uh, was talking about um, our first. Uh, big discovery project looked at uh, blue eyes, right? So eye color is something that's very easy for an owner to report. Um, and, and we did a, a preliminary genome-wide association study looking at owners that had reported their dog had blue eyes or were heterochromatic for blue eyes. And as we expected, the the that GWAS study came back with a significant association um, at, at this uh, PML gene on chromosome 10 well, we already know that's the Merle locus, and we know Merle dogs can have blue eyes, so, so that was not surprising. Um, but we found this really strong signal on chromosome 18, and it was being driven uh, primarily by Siberian Huskies. So the Siberian Huskies with blue eyes had a haplotype in this uh, region that we, weren't, that we weren't seeing elsewhere. And we could look at sequencing data. So we have this SNP here that's associated um, with the blue eye phenotype. And when we look at the sequencing data, the dogs with a SNP seem to have a duplication of almost 100 kilobases across this region. And so this is sort of a classical problem in genetic mapping, is what's the causal variant, right? So these are both, you know, not coding variants. This is a regulatory variant. Um, a lot of times structural variation can underlie, um, uh, un underlie phenotypes like this. So was it the SNP or is it the duplication that's driving you? And what's really nice about having a research setup like we have at Embark is this ability to prospectively go out and survey owners. So, you know, we, we passively collected data on eye color from over 3000 dogs to do this initial study. And now that we had this association with chromosome 18 and we're looking for fine mapping, we can go through and we can target certain dogs now. And we can um, send out a new study survey with pictures of various doggy eye colors and, and we can send them out to um, dogs that, that have this duplication, that have that SNP or don't. And we can see if it, do we have in this validation sample, what do we get? And so we could uh, type the duplication. We obviously typed the, the, the GWAS allele. We could look at the p-value now from these additional 2,700 dogs. Um, clearly the SNP is still highly associated. A 10 to the minus 120th power is a, is a really significant finding in GWAS. But the duplication is even more associated, right? So it's clearly the duplication is the one that's predisposing. Um, it's not completely penetrant, which also explains the heterochromia, <coughs> but it's also it's also dominant as well. So it only takes one copy, although dogs with two copies are even more likely uh, to show the blue-eyed phenotype than, than dogs with one copy. Now, um, you know, we, we've... Uh, blue eyes before. I know you guys are all on this right now because you want to see what what the cutting edge uh, research is um, that that we're doing. Um, I, I'll have a couple sneak peeks here. So we've done a similar study um, to blue eyes, looking at the Ronin locus, right? And so we could identify this Ronin phenotype from owner reports, from photos. It's common in in several uh, breeds. It's also a dominant phenotype, and it also seems to be due um, to a duplication that's in a regulatory region, in this case of the Usherin gene. And so we can sort of see um, dogs that have this roaning, um, they have white spotting, and then they also have this duplication um, uh, here uh, in this regulatory region. 
Um, we've also done research. And so this is the, these are all, um, uh, you know, things that we have uh, in review right now. So, you know, we believe in publishing our science. Uh, we, we want peer review. We want, we want to do good science here. Um, an additional uh, defect that we've mapped uh, is factor nine deficiency. So this was found in a mixed breed dog. It comes from um, Great Pyrenees. So this is something that we can add to our array. We can look at the population uh, frequency now of, of uh, the variant. And then finally, and this is one we've already turned on as a test, it's in review right now, uh, but because there was such, such demand for the test, um, we, we can now look at the genes underlying uh, pheomelanin intensity. So it's been called the eye locus, but it's really five different genes that we see um, interacting. And, and so this is why we see this gradated um, you know, intensity phenotype. And this is explaining about 73% of the variation we're seeing um, in, in this color and um, higher in some breeds, lower in other breeds. So it's gonna be an ongoing research project, but it's, it's sort of starting to tackle that some of these traits that we're interested in really are complex genetics. Um, but if we have the phenotypic data to combine with the genetic data, um, we are able to tackle this. And so that's why, you know, what, what's important here is, is you. Like we need you, uh, we need owners and we need breeders uh, not only to do the DNA testing um, on a research grade array like Embark, but then also to, to give the phenotypic information that's gonna be needed um, to drive these discovery studies. So if you go to the research profile right now, um, the research highlight is uh, the annual uh, health survey. We've had this up for two weeks now, as our, as, you know, we sent the, the emails out. Um, the responses have been fantastic. I can actually give you a sneak peek at some of the responses that we've been getting. Um, it's not a hard survey to fill out. If your dog's healthy, it's only going to take a couple minutes. Uh, if your dog has health problems, it's going to take a little longer because we want to hear about them. Um, but it's still, you know, it's this is the first step of research. You don't have to like scan in clinical documentation or any of that stuff. This is just so that we know that your dog should be uh, included in a study that we can reach out to you if we need more information. The very first question on the study is actually, you know, quite simple. And it's this, how, how would you rate your dog's health? Like, is your dog in excellent health? Is your dog in good health, fair or poor? <coughs> Excuse me. So you, you may think, you know, a question like this sounds really unscientific, but again, this is the power of big data. You get tens of thousands of people, or even better, hundreds of thousands of people telling uh, telling you about their dogs and you have genetic information, you can make all sorts of really uh, cool associations with that, even with a really simple thing like this. And so, you know, fortunately, most embarkers have dogs that are in excellent health. So two thirds of the dogs are in excellent health, according to their owner, which is great. Um, but there, there's certainly patterns to this. And so, you know, as you would expect, um, because small dogs age more slowly than big dogs do. So there's this age impact. Your puppies are more likely to be in excellent health than elderly dogs are. And that aging process happens faster in big dogs than in small dogs. So we know the size of the dog, we know the genetics of the dog, and we know what the owner's telling us about the health of the dog. And we can get this, we can get this clear sort of pattern coming through. And what was particularly interesting, I thought, is we see a pattern that's at least as strong, if not stronger, if we separate out dogs based on COI, right? So if you look at outbred dogs, um, so COI of 0 0.02 or less, you can see that they're rated in excellent health more than uh, inbred dogs, so dogs with COI of above 25%. And, um, you know, so if, if you want your dog to age a couple of years more slowly, um, it seems like COI is, is probably something that's worth managing. Um, I don't want to belabor it too much because uh, we're going to be talking about this much more tomorrow in the diversity sessions. Um, but, but I do want to say this, you know, this gives us an opportunity. We can, we can see, okay, we are like, people have said COI might be important for health. We can do this really simple gut check and we can see, yes, it, it actually is coming through in the data. Um, we do want breeders to like consider this information, use the matchmaker for it. Um, we also did this check with DLA diversity, right? So we report whether um, whether two of the DLA genes are high diversity or low diversity. We're not seeing that significant effect of DLA diversity uh, on this metric. Now, again, this is a course metric. You can kind of squint and say maybe middle-aged dogs, there's a little bit of an effect of having higher DLA diversity. 
This doesn't mean that we don't do more DLA studies. It might be important for specific diseases that just don't show up when you're doing a population average. But it is, you know, you can only consider so many dimensions in a breeding decision. And so this is why right now our diversity tools are favoring using COI for the breeding decisions and DLA is just something that's that's reported on a per dog basis, but not for not for matchmaking. So if you if you want to know more about diversity and inbreeding and whatnot, I strongly encourage you 11 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Aaron Sams is the guy, uh, principal scientist that's that's you know running um, the the show for this research, and he he can get into a lot more uh, detail about what's going on. Uh, my point for for bringing all this up is um, right now uh, in the first couple weeks of of um, advertising the study, we're up past. I just checked this week at 87 thousand dogs that we have this survey data for now and we've got a goal of a hundred thousand by the end of february so if there's if you have tested with embark and you have not filled out an annual health survey for other dogs please log in and do that it would be fantastic if we had um this database you know this this resource and and what it drives our priorities as scientists for the coming year right it, it tells our our researchers and the researchers we collaborate with what conditions are we seeing enough cases or controls for that we can that we can potentially do a high powered study? Um, you know, these studies require a lot of additional work. A lot, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you're going to do a study on cardiac disease, you're probably going to want to have an expert looking at, you know, echocardiograms and things like that. We're, we, 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 we can't afford to invest that effort um, if we don't already know that we have a lot of cases already. Um, that we that we've characterized, and so this is this is our ability to to prioritize um, based on that. And and so if owners and breeders don't fill out this this initial survey that doesn't take very long, um, then then our researchers aren't going to know to prioritize stuff as as being important. We aren't going to see that potentially we have this pool of of cases that we can that we can utilize, um, you know, either internally or working in collaboration with experts elsewhere to say, hey, you know, we've got a lot of dogs that have this kind of cancer, we know you're doing this study, like, can we work together? Or do you want to use this data or, you know, something like that. Um, some of the, um, so, you know, just looking at the survey data that we've gotten from this year, uh, dermatological issues seem to be um, one of the most uh, common sets of issues, but also orthopedic disease, dental disease, behavioral, um, cardiac, all of these, um, all of these things um, we have significant fractions of dogs that are being reported. And so then the question is for a specific disease within that category, and in some cases for a specific breed, do we have enough that we can start launching a study? And, you know, as you, as you parse it down that, you know, 100,000 dogs get smaller and smaller and smaller until you don't have enough to do a study. And so it's really, really important um, that as many people as possible fill out these surveys about their dogs. So we, we have this opportunity to include as many dogs as possible uh, in these studies. There are three studies we have right now that we're actively recruiting for, um, dilated cardiomyopathy, which we're doing in collaboration with Hills. So this is a combination, um, you know, genetic and nutritional uh, study because it, it's a disease that is both genetic and probably nutritional. Um, we're also looking at tricuspid valve dysplasia. Um, that study is focused on Labradors. Uh, we call it the Labrador Heart Project. Um, and we're also looking at Wobbler's disease and still recruiting cases there, primarily from Dobermans, but also from uh, from other breeds. So in all three cases, if you know of dogs that are affected with this, we have research pages. Uh, you can email research at embarkvet.com. We would love to include the dog uh, in the study. And again, if you've already embarked with us, fill out the annual health survey and we'll be sure to include the dog um, in these studies as well. So hopefully I've left a couple minutes for questions. Um, there's, there's really just a huge number of people uh, you know, to thank uh, the the science team, especially. I've been you know really proud of all the work uh, put in. Um, but obviously, the whole the whole crew at Embark, uh, you know, everyone from the front lines of customer service and logistics to the back lines of of you know engineering. Um, it's it's been quite a team that they've put together. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without the support of you know Cornell University's um, vet college. Um, the licensing and technology and, and the veterinary biobank um, that, that really helped us establish the, the, the core of our product that we've been able to now um, build out and just make better and better. And we hope to be able to continue that for years to come. Thank you. So it looks like we've got a few questions coming in here. Um, 
from uh, uh, from the from the chat. So, what are the best practices when breeding for polygenic characteristics? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, one, you know, obviously you can use the the parental phenotypes, and as it as something becomes more and more polygenic, then the offspring should be closer and closer to the mid parent value. Um, but for you know, some things like intensity where it is just a handful of, of loci, you know, actually include, you know, looking at the individual sub loci and figuring out, okay, so, you know, we're, we're fixed at this locus, this is the one that's variable, and this, you know, preferring to breed the ones that are homozygous versus heterozygous are going to lead to richer or duller intensity, and that's what I want, you know, to, you're going to have to peel under the hood and look at that. Um, that's why we don't just give a top line intensity score. We we also give the sub locus results so that that you you have all the information that you can uh, that you can get for that. Um, you know, eventually we may get to the point where some conditions are like what they do with livestock, where you're really just using a polygenic uh, score, a uh, breeding value, and and you're you're making decisions based on that. Um, we don't currently the dog genetic testing world isn't there, uh, and maybe it'll never. Maybe it'll never get there, um, but I, I, I've learned in science never to say never, and so that's certainly a possibility as well. Do you think that the origins work that you did also connects to dogs such as the one used uh, by the indigenous people of the Arctic region? Um, absolutely, there's lots of really interesting um, uh, genetic research going on there. Uh, one great thing is that the Arctic is great at preserving um, specimens, and so ancient DNA work has been really um, uh, interesting um, looking at that region, and there's been multiple migrations across the uh, Beringia, um, you know, both with the peopling of America and the dogging of America, and you have initial waves of dogs, and then you had subsequent waves uh, of dogs. Um, and, and actually, it seems like sled dogs um, in Siberia were actually probably the first kind of type of dog that was purpose-bred. So there's, there's clearly remains of dogs that look like they were bred to be sledging dogs from 9,500 uh, years ago. Uh, so that predates even sight hounds, which are one of the older uh, dog types. I'd love to hear about IVDD as relevant to your breed. I've worked really hard to clear all of my dogs and now they have all been shown to have two variants. Yes, so IVDD is a really, really interesting um, condition. It's actually really exceptional um, for a test. Um, so the, the underlying mutation for IVDD is a duplication. And so as such, it's not something that we can directly test for with the array, right? Because we're, we're, we're trying to match the DNA, but if this is a duplication, it's going to match regardless, right? And so what we're looking at is the haplotype in which the mutation is embedding itself. And so it's a linkage test, right? So linkage tests have been available, uh, you know, for a long time. But so this means that the accuracy for detecting the mutation is about 95 to 99%. Uh, and so we, it, we, we do have it as a test because that linkage haplotype is highly predictive of whether a dog is gonna get IVDD. So it's not, a, it, obviously it's not uh, completely penetrant, right? And in fact, most dogs that are at risk for IVDD don't develop it. But if you are at risk for IVDD, your dog, and, and, and it tests positive either from the linkage test or from the mutation test, your dog is 40 to 50 times more likely to get diagnosed with it in its lifetime. So essentially your risk is zero if you're clear and your risk is not zero, but not 100% if you have it. And the thing is the IVDD mutation also gives the shorter stature. Um, it's, it's separate from the, the, from the classic achondro dysplasia locus on chromosome 18, which is also a duplication, which is also something that we don't directly test for for the same reason, um, um, which is kind of your corgi dachshund fixed mutation. And this one just leads to a little bit lesser stature, but seems to be predisposing for IVDD. And so you see it in beagles. Um, it's also segregating in, in um, you know, dachshunds and corgis. Uh, and, and so in some of these toy breeds, it's at exceptionally high frequency. So because the mutation itself is correlated with the risk, these breeds do have an elevated risk. It's something that gets reported on the profile, but the dog's risk is not elevated compared to the rest of the breed because the rest of the breed also has it. So whatever the risk is for the breed for IVDD, 
that's the risk that's shared for for a beagle that tests positive for it. And we would we would recommend not trying to breed away from it because essentially then you'd be losing the vast majority of genetic diversity in the breed. It's just something that has to be managed. I think that's a really long-winded answer to your question, um, but it is. It's such an important um, thing because it is a debilitating disease, it's preventable, I think giving people the knowledge that, hey, I, I, I need to keep an eye out. I don't want my dog, you know, doing certain agility things or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's not, obviously, you know, it's not a death sentence. Most dogs aren't even going to develop it. It's just, you know, one of those things to be aware of. And I think over time, we're going to have more and more tests that are like that. Hey, this has been associated with this. It's fixed in this breed. It's just something to know about. All right. Sometimes I don't know how to interpret all of my dog's genetic results. Is there a service at Embark to help me? Yes. Yes, there is. We actually, so we have uh, three DVMs on staff. Uh, we're, we're looking to hire more this year as we grow up the team. Um, we, you know, I, we, we don't have a genetic counseling service per se, you know, but certainly any breeder that's testing with us, if you're confused about a certain test, you know, drop us a line. Uh, we're, we're a little bit uh, buried right now because everybody's just got their results back for, you know, that had unwrapped them under the Christmas tree and sent them in and they got lost by the post office for two weeks. Um, but, but no, we, we, we prioritize, um, you know, breeder customer service. We want to make sure that you understand your test results because, because the worst thing is, you know, we, we find something that's incorrectly um, interpreted and, and it winds up not doing the good that it's supposed to do. Has there been any work done on the heritability of food allergies? That's a really great question. So we're asking about allergies in the annual health survey. Um, uh, there's obviously a huge environmental component. It's, it would be a very difficult problem to study, but one of the first things to look at would be, um, can we calculate a heritability based on the relatedness of the dogs in the database? Uh, or can we estimate it based on differences in breed prevalence? And so again, this is a big data problem. I think we're well poised um, to start moving forward um, you know, on that research. Are you working with horse, cow, sheep, goat, rabbit research on color, hair, fiber? Fantastic question. You know, I'm, I'm a researcher at a vet school and I love, you know, I've done some horse papers. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I am embedded with the cat community. We have a 99 lives project that's being led by Lisa, uh, Leslie Lyons, um, um, th that, that I'm a member of. Um, but, but Embark, Embark's mission is to end preventable disease in dogs. And so we want to do good research in dogs. We want to focus on dogs. There is so much we can do for dogs. And I think us specializing on dogs and getting that research published and into the hands of all of these really great academics everywhere across the world that are working on all sorts of species is probably the best way um, uh, to move that forward. But, you know, ask me again in five years, right? Like maybe, you know, maybe it does make uh, make sense to do that. But, you know, if anything, there's a hundred times more studies I'd like to be doing on dogs um, th than right now. And uh, we foster kittens here at my house, but, but honestly, genetically dogs are a lot more interesting, uh, but I'm a little biased. So yeah, so um, we're looking for a lab in the USA to test for Lephora. I'm, uh, so Lephora is also this, uh, it's a, a dodecamer repeat expansion. So it's not the kind of thing that a SNP array um, can, can test for. Um, we, we definitely are sensitive to the idea that, that breeders are looking for an all-in-one um, product. Um, so, you know, primarily our, our interest is in scientific accuracy and disseminating accurate information. But secondarily, we definitely want to be able to serve those needs. And so it, it's possible we can partner with another lab that's doing it or develop a different assay. Um, but it wouldn't ever be something that can be part of a standard, um, you know, SNP assay. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those two to 3% of mutations that, that just can't be accurately surveyed uh, with, with a SNP array. Do you have any information about the genetics of hemangiosarcomas? <coughs> yeah, so there's been work out of Elaine Ostrander's lab on at least histiolytic sarcomas um, from a while ago. And so it's, it's likely some of the genetic bases are gonna be similar. Um, uh, it, it looks like it's complicated genetics. We, last I checked, don't have a huge number of hermangiosarcoma cases, so we haven't been able to verify associations or build our own um, predictive models. Um, but it's something along with lymphoma and mast cell tumor that, that we are 
uh, you know, definitely interested in in doing. I would encourage, you know, if there are if there are breeds where where there are a lot of cases, you know, the more testing that's that's being done, then the quicker we'll be able to to actually see what we can find. Uh, possible study on Lexata patella. Oh, I just got three emails from Dr. Todd Hunter at Cornell today, so we're really interested. In, in, in working with, um, with uh, Cornell, um, orthopedic disease, as you see, is one of the um, you know, main categories uh, that, that, that people are complaining about. You know, again, this is a complex genetics environmental thing, um, but I think we're finally getting to the point where we're getting big enough data sizes um, that, we'll, we'll, that we'll be able to see. Is this something that is a genetic risk score can be developed for or not? And I, and I think that's an open question um, and it really depends on how well powered these studies can be. Okay. Wow, so many good questions. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Boyko. This is great. So I did have one very brief question for you because we're about out of time. I need to switch. But um, you know, we were seeing a number of comments and questions about this. You talked earlier about Embark's commitment to research in our annual health surveys. Um, but in addition to this, Embark empowers every customer by providing a complete set of research-ready data for their dog. So just very briefly, can you explain or, or speak to um, how it is we can provide this data and why it's why it's so unique that we can do this? Right, so um, I, I believe we're the only dog DNA test that lets you download your raw data, right? So um, we definitely do not wanna be the gatekeepers um, that prevent your breed club from working with whoever they want to work with. Our, our goal is to get as much dog DNA data into the hands of researchers, consumers, and breeders as possible. Um, you know, we, we work on packaging our test and, 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 you know, saying what traits are and what, what the health conditions are, but this genetic data repository, you know, like we, we want to share this, um, but, but with the, with the owner, and breeder being in control, right? We're not we're not posting people's genetic data on on, on public websites, um, but for but for the dogs opted into doing research, you know, we, we do research studies on these, and um, and so yeah, I think that that puts us in a unique position. I mean, you don't have to trust us about your dog's DNA. You can actually look at the ACTGs uh, yourself if you're so inclined. And, and we do have some. Yeah, it's it's not a huge number, but we definitely have the one percent that like power through and are and are super excited at it. Awesome. Terrific. Terrific. Well, thank you very much again. Um, really appreciate your talk. That was uh, very informative.